I've learned a lesson that some things in life that are really good take just about forever to happen. But it's worth holding on and working for them. This is one of those things. When the lights dim and I hear the sounds, 25 years disappear and I'm back in Tron. talking with a number of colleagues at Disney who had been thinking about Tron and I said here are the things I just really remember uh, uh, off of my gut I remember suits that were lit light cycles Jeff Bridges and a screen that looked unlike any movie screen I'd ever seen before I said in my opinion that's what we're beholden to this is the key to a new order Sean Bailey called me in for a general meeting in July 2007 and, you know, in a general meeting, typically you talk about a couple different projects, but Sean really wanted to talk to me about Tron and just ask me what would my take be on a Tron sequel. Very shortly thereafter, we met Eddie Kitsis and Anna Horowitz. Her agents uh, called us and said, would you be interested in Tron, which was like the dream come true because we were both obsessed with the movie. We felt like there were certain design elements and pieces that they had done incredibly well and were incredibly ahead of their time, but we also felt we had to do some new things. And I guess so at first I was a little apprehensive about bringing that up with Steve and Liz Berger. Everybody wants to see cyberspace get real, and I think that's a really exciting thing, to have all this technology behind it, to realize it in a way that we couldn't have conceived of when we did the first film. A movie like this, you know, you can talk to you blue in the face, but ultimately you need to show them something. So I would propose the idea of creating a two or three minute piece, kind of like a mini trailer for a movie that didn't exist yet. You'll shoot lock-offs and, and take them through a series of moves that'll, that'll get the movement you want. It was funny, as we started to write the script, Joe went off to shoot the, the test footage. We got Jeff to be a part of it, which is really important. I don't think this movie would exist without him being involved. He was integral to even getting this thing off the ground. This technology was so fascinating. And that was very exciting to come to realize all the things that you can do. So I jumped for it and we shot this trailer. <laughs> has become kind of the barometer for what people are interested in when it comes to big movies. We showed it to an audience that had no idea they were going to see it. I remember sitting there with Joe and a couple guys from the studio, and we were really nervous because we thought, well, if this plays well, we're probably off and making our movie, and if it doesn't, we're probably not. Hey,
such a great reaction from the fans that uh, Disney said, oh yeah, we can put the money that it's going to cost to make this film a reality. Well, it was one of those things where you kind of dream it, you imagine best case scenario, and then everything just kind of fell into place. The challenge of writing Tron was coming into it and saying, how, how do we honor the original movie, continue that story, expand on it, and, and take it to a new place while also opening up the world for new fans. Tron and I, we beat the evil MCP and finally got out, and finally we came home. There's so much interesting, you know, mythology in the first movie, and then we said, you know, it has been so long, and a lot of the, our target audience won't have seen the original, they won't have been born when the original was created. At the end of the original Tron, Kevin Flynn jumps out of a helicopter on top of Encom Tower, and what we're saying at that point is he created the Tron video game based on his experiences in that movie. At the same time, he's continuing to do research on this universe that he found. So he actually spends his nights beaming himself in and out of the computer world. So we just kind of wrote this interim mythology from 82 to 89, where he gets stuck inside of the, of the computer again, uh, disappears off the face of the planet, um, you know, for the next 20 years or so. Well, Kevin went into the computer and he got stuck in there and he's been in there for 20 years, and that's where we find them. The notion of living inside a computer world as an avatar is something that couldn't be more relevant in 2010. We put together a really exciting room with people from Caltech and JPL to test our theories of, you know, the biological form going into digital space. And remarkably, they said, well, under certain circumstances, we could imagine in the future, if you had enough computing power, and you use something called quantum science, you could have such a uh, circumstance. It relates directly to quantum teleportation. It fits, it, it fits the quantum teleportation model. Yes. His quantum information is destroyed in the process of creating the quantum it, it's information. It's teleportation, it's not cloning. It's destroyed. It's destroyed. It's destroyed. It's destroyed. It's destroyed. It's it is not. It is not physically destroyed. It is actually negated. I love those guys. They've read the script, and the next thing you know, you've got a neuroscientist arguing with an artificial intelligence scientist about what an ISO girl program